Hey everybody, it's Russ from Retro Game Core. We have another handheld PC review for you today. This one is by 1X Player and the first device of theirs that I've reviewed. The one that we'll be looking at today is called the Mini Pro. Now this is with a Ryzen 7 6800U inside, which is a pretty hefty chipset. This is the same chipset that we found in the IA Neo 2, which I reviewed not that long ago, and it has about 25% better performance than the Steam Deck at max capacity. And so as you can imagine, this is geared more towards a hardcore gaming audience. In fact, on the front here, it has this little text that says gaming computer for hardcore gamers. And so obviously if you're looking for something that's just more kind of an everyday handheld PC and the best bang for your buck, I still think it's gonna be the Steam Deck. But honestly, that's not really the audience of this right here. In fact, this is for people who don't really care as much about price as they do when it comes to really good gaming performance and maybe a smaller form factor as well. In fact, it even has RGB lighting on the sides of it, which is pretty cool and reminds me of those custom built PCs. And so I think the people who are gonna be interested in watching this video are gonna be twofold. There's gonna be those who are maybe looking for something like the Steam Deck, but with better performance and maybe a smaller size. And the other half are the people who are like me, who are just a little bit curious of what kind of performance we can get out of a PC like this. And so I'm excited to do a bunch of testing and show off those results. And so without any further delay, let's dive into it. Okay, there's a lot of specs here to talk about, so let's go over these quickly. I already mentioned that we have an 8-core, 16-thread Ryzen 7 6800U chip inside. And so far, we've seen this in a couple other devices, the INEO 2 as well as the GPD WinMax 2. And right now, this is the best chip that you can get for any of these devices. Now, this has integrated graphics, and it's using the same RDNA 2 architecture as found in the Steam Deck but the CPU itself is a little bit more powerful, and so that's where we're getting those performance gains. The Mini Pro uses LPDDR5 RAM clocked at 6400 megahertz, and for storage, it's using a 2280 M.2 NVMe slot. Now this comes with a 16 by 10 aspect ratio seven inch screen with a resolution of 1920 by 1200. And in terms of connectivity, we've got the standard Wi-Fi 6 and Bluetooth 5.0. The battery capacity on this is 48 watt hours. We will talk more about that in depth later in the video. And we've got a couple other features that I'll mention later in the video, things like six axis gyro, hall sensor analog sticks, as well as a modifiable rumble. Long story short, this has all the features that I would hope for in a high-end PC minus one. And that one missing feature is a micro SD card slot. Now pricing here starts at $1,200 and that is for the model that I'm reviewing here. It has 16 gigs of RAM and 512 gigs of storage. And you can upgrade the RAM to 32 gigs and the storage up to two terabytes if you'd like to do that. The end result here will be $1,550 here for the fully specced model. Now the most similar comparison to this price point and model is going to be the Aya Neo 2 devices. Now this one's still under its Indiegogo prices, but right now it's about $1,100 for a similarly specced one from Aya Neo. And one other thing to note here is that 1X Player has been making handhelds for a while and they have another one coming out here soon. Their next one is called the 1X Player 2, and it has some unique features that I wanted to mention here in this video. To start, this one's gonna have detachable controllers, much like the Nintendo Switch. And I'm really interested to see how this is all gonna play out in terms of just overall ergonomics. Additionally, this one's gonna have the largest screen that I've seen in this form factor. It's gonna be 8.4 inches altogether. And finally, it's gonna have a much larger battery. We're looking at over 65 watt hours here. And so I should be getting a review unit for this one here in the next few weeks, and so I'll be sure to make a video about this as well. In the meantime, they should be dropping their crowdfunding campaign the same day that I'm releasing this video. And so I will also have a link to this device in the video description. And they're doing some neat things here, like the ability to sign up to be a public beta tester. And I think they're running a giveaway as well. Anyway, I'll throw all that stuff in the description. And so let's get to the meat and potatoes here and actually unbox and try out this device. To start, you can see that everything has the same kind of design language of this black and orange color. It does come with a quick manual, just kind of walking you through some of the basic settings. And the inside packaging here is pretty simple. We have a nice braided USB-C cable, and then a power supply that's rated for up to 100 watts. Bear in mind that quick charging on this device goes up to 65 watts altogether. And so here's a look at the device itself. First impressions here is that it's a little bit more angular than I was thinking it would be. In addition to the device being kind of an octagon shape altogether, it also uses a bunch of trapezoids for its buttons and speakers. And so just right off the bat, everything just feels a little bit more angular and gamery in design. I also like the more unified orange accents here just across the entire device. And so I would say overall, it gives me the impression of being a handheld computer more so than like a handheld gaming console. So let's go ahead and take a look around. We'll start with the bottom. 
Here we have a single USB-C port as well as what looks to be additional speaker holes as well. And like I mentioned before, no micro SD card slot. And then up top we have the power button and volume buttons, then a headphone jack, and then an additional USB-C port. And quick note here, both of these USB-C ports are USB 4.0 or Thunderbolt 4. This means that you can charge the device either from the top or the bottom, and you can also use either of these ports for video out. In more practical terms, that would mean that you could use something like a Steam Deck dock to be able to connect it to the top here and then have it a dockable solution. But then also, if you wanted to dock it from the bottom, you could do that as well. Now this thing's a little bit thicker than the Steam Deck, and so because of that, you wouldn't be able to use, for example, the official Valve dock. But some of the more wide third-party docks, like this one here from iVolver, will work just fine. And finally, by virtue of being Thunderbolt 4, you could also use an external GPU with this device as well. I'm always happy to see a USB-A port as well, it just makes things very practical. Other than that, up top we have an exhaust vent. Nothing on the sides other than the RGB lighting strip, which we'll talk about here in a minute. Here's a quick look at the back. You can see the plastic here is a little bit prone to smudging. And then other than that, we just got a large intake vent. Now the device also has some nice chunky grips right here, and they also went with full-size triggers as well. And so overall, it does feel pretty chunky in the hands. Now these triggers are analog, but they're not hall sensor. And I would say they are nice and responsive and glide fairly smoothly, but there is a little bit of friction with the button itself. You can definitely feel that it's a magnetic trigger. These shoulder buttons feel good. They have a nice soft click to them, very reminiscent of the Xbox controller. And so in terms of overall grip, I think this is pretty nice right here. My index finger is very comfortable up here on the trigger, and then the other fingers have plenty of space as well. And so I would say the ergonomics here are pretty good. It's more in that kind of small to mid size when it comes to handheld PCs, but these big grips do make it feel more comfortable. So now let's move over to the front of the device, starting with the analog sticks. Now these are Hall Sensor analog sticks, and they are super smooth. With the exception of the metal analog sticks that you find in some devices like the Gillicut King Kong Pro 2, as well as the Ioneo 2, these plastic analog sticks right here are probably some of the smoothest that I've ever used. It's really apparent when you're playing something that has a lot of 3D motion, like Hades. This is a really nice and smooth experience, especially on sticks that aren't quite huge. And so it's a nice mixture of having sticks that are portable and small, but then also feel really good in the hands too. These are definitely one of my favorite highlights of the device. These sticks themselves have a little bit of a soft rubber texture to them that makes them a little bit grippy, but then also kind of tacky as well. Personally, I like to have analog sticks that have a bumpy texture, but I wouldn't say that these are bad either. Now let's talk about the D-pad. This has a four-way kind of direction to it, much like with on the Xbox One controllers as well as on the Steam Deck. Now these are flared at each of the edges, which makes them pretty handy when it comes to rolling. And so if you wanted to throw a dragon punch or a fireball, it is relatively easy in something like Street Fighter. But I will say that the pivot on this D-pad is lower than on the Steam Deck. And so while those flared edges do make it handy when it comes to rolls, I often found that I was still missing diagonals regardless. Just in my own observation when playing Street Fighter V, I was probably making only about 75% of the moves as I tried to do them. And same thing when playing a precise platformer like Celeste. There were often times when I was trying to do a diagonal up and left or up and right, and instead I would just go straight up instead. And so in the end, I would say this is a pretty good D-pad. It works well in most use cases. But for those types of games that really need a specific input when it comes to diagonals, this one falls a little bit short. I really think that the pivot on this D-pad should be just a tiny bit higher. Okay, also on the left side here up top, we have a menu or select button, and these have a soft clickiness to them here. And then down here on the bottom left, we have a show desktop button. So anytime you're in a game and you want to see the desktop, you would just press that. And then here's that text I mentioned in the intro. They are really trying to appeal to the hardcore gaming crowd right here. The most interesting thing here on the right side are going to be these face buttons. These are nice and large, not quite the size of a console controller, but pretty close. What I really like about them is that they have a flat texture to them. It feels a lot like a PlayStation controller. These are using a rubber membrane connection and have a good amount of travel here. I think they're just about perfect. They also have a glossy texture to them, which feels really sleek and professional. The positioning here is pretty good as well. As you can see here, just in a natural hand holding position, the right analog stick doesn't really get in the way of pressing these buttons. It definitely bumps up against your thumb, but I never felt like it was getting in the way of actually playing. So overall, I would say I'm very happy with these face buttons here. I would give them like an eight or a nine out of 10. Also on the right side, we have an analog stick and then our start button here on the top. On the bottom here, we have two buttons. The top one shows the keyboard and the second one brings up the 1x player quick menu. And then of course, front and center, we have this large seven inch screen. But I think to best appreciate it, we should turn the device on now and have a look. 
So here we are. I think the screen looks really good here and the bezels are minimal. I think we've also got a good ratio when it comes to the controller itself and the size of the screen. It feels very balanced. And it comes pre-installed with Windows 11 Home. And here's a look at those quick menu buttons. The top one here shows the keyboard. And then the next one here is the star of the show. This is the One X Player menu. And I gotta say, this is probably my favorite quick menu of any device I've ever tested. Number one, it gives you access to all the things that you would probably want. There's a TDP slider right here that goes anywhere from four to 28 watts and you can adjust it by the single watt. You can also adjust the GPU frequency and fan speed, but honestly, I keep those on auto. You also have the ability to adjust vibration settings on the fly which is super helpful. And most importantly, you can adjust the resolution to a myriad of options right here. And these resolution adjustments happen instantaneously and are super seamless. And I'll show this more when we get to actual gameplay, but this is a lifesaver. On top of that, we can adjust the RGB lighting. We can either turn it off or adjust it to some of the other various colors. By default, it's gonna be the orange coloring here, but honestly, I think that makes it just a little bit too orange. My favorite and the one we'll use for most of this video is the one called Flowing Light. And there are quite a few other options as well, so I do recommend experimenting with these different options. I found that I really enjoy the positioning of the lights right here. It kind of makes your hands glow, but it doesn't distract away from the screen. Speaking of the screen, let's talk a little bit about that. The color balance seems to be fairly accurate, but the saturation here is, I would say, average at best. It's certainly not bad, but nothing that blew my socks off. One thing I did note is that the dimness here does not get very dim. For example, here's a comparison against the Steam Deck at its lowest setting. And so when it comes to late night gaming, I would say this is not a perfect fit. It's just a little bit too bright for a very dark environment. But at full brightness, it's pretty good. Here is a comparison against the Steam Deck at full brightness as well. I would say the max brightness here is about the same between the two, but that the darks are a little bit darker on the One X player than the Steam Deck. So that will give you some better defined contrast when playing a game. Now, sadly, I do not have my Aya Neo 2 review unit here to do a comparison. I actually lent it to somebody else so they could make a review on their channel. And so when it comes to a comparison of Aya Neo devices, we'll do the Air Pro instead. Now, this one's a little bit unfair when it comes to comparison because it is an OLED panel, so the colors are going to be more saturated and the darks are darker as well. And so in the end, I think overall this screen is good. It has a nice resolution, good color balance, and saturation. I have seen better on other devices, but all the same, I am still super happy with the quality here. Now, one place where it does shine is in the audio department. Having front firing speakers makes a world of difference with some of these handhelds. So let's take a listen here. And so overall, I would say the audio quality here is above average. It lacks a little bit of clarity in the high ends, but it also has a nice rich texture to it. And I like the fact that it's blasting directly into my face. And so when it comes to handheld PCs, I think the only one that has better sound than this one is going to be the Steam Deck. Okay, and last section here before we get into gameplay is going to be size and weight comparisons. Here's a comparison against the Nintendo Switch Lite, and then as well as a full shot here of the INEO Air Pro. Moving a little bit larger in size, here is the AYN Odin Pro. As you can see, this is a little bit larger than the Switch Lite. The handheld I have right now that's in about the same size is actually going to be the Logitech Cloud. This one also has a 7 inch display, but it's only 16 by 9, which does give it a smaller surface area than the other. Now, the display size is the same as it is on the Steam Deck, but as you can see here, the Steam Deck is quite a bit larger. Also, bear in mind the Steam Deck only has a resolution of 1280 by 800. In terms of weight, the One X Player Mini Pro is 615 grams, which is a little under a pound and a half. That puts it in between something like the Ioneo Air, and then also a little bit lighter than the Steam Deck as well. Okay, and so as we move into the game testing portion here, I just want to bring up that quick menu option again. As you can see here, it is super snappy to jump in and out of it, and it allows you to adjust the resolution or the TDP on the fly. And this is going to be a really important component when it comes to playing PC games on a handheld like this. Because we have some relatively limited battery life, we want to balance the power profile with the resolution as much as possible to play as much as we can. And so let me show you what that means in a more practical sense. Here is Resident Evil 3 running here at 1200p on low settings. And as you can see, a 15 watt TDP will give us an average of between 55 and 60 frames per second. Now, if you wanted to have a higher frame rate, you've got a couple options. The first one here would be to just increase the TDP. And so just by moving the slider from 15 to 19, I now am getting a solid 60 frames per second. Of course, by using a 20 watt power draw like this, it is going to reduce the battery life. And so if you're in a situation where you're trying to extend your battery life, you have other options. For example, we can just tap on this quick menu here, adjust the resolution here to 800p instead, 
And then we can draw down the TDP back to 15 watts and look at that, we're getting a solid 60 frames per second. And I gotta say an 800p display does not look bad on the screen either. The 1200p definitely looks sharper, but you do have that big performance cost. Let's do another example here. Here is God of War running at a 20 watt TDP on 800p low settings. For this one, I've set a frame rate cap to 40 frames per second, but as you can see, it's playing great. Now, if we wanted, we can bump this up to 1200p instead, but as you can see, it's gonna struggle to maintain around 35 frames per second. And so if you wanted to have the higher resolution, but you wanted to get closer to that 40 frames per second cap, then you would have to increase the TDP. And so here, I'm just gonna move the slider all the way up to 28 watts. Now, one thing to bear in mind, when you move it to 28 watts, it'll often bump all the way up to 34 watts instead. So it's really just giving the max wattage that it can on this device. But as you can see right here, it's actually not reaching 40 frames per second. And so really that increase from 20 to 28 watts and beyond doesn't seem to really be worth it. You're getting about three frames per second better, but losing a lot of battery life too. And so really that's what I mean when it comes to balance is that you have to find the best graphical resolution for the TDP that you're willing to live with. And for me personally, when it comes to God of War, it's gonna be 800p and 20 watts. The great thing about this device here is that it's very easy to swap between all these different options. In fact, it's the easiest of any other handheld PC that I've tried. And that includes the Steam Deck, which has some of these options nestled under various menu settings that you have to find. Of everything I've ever tested, this one seems to do it the best. So now let's run through some of these PC games. We'll start with the easy ones and work our way up. For the more lightweight indie games, things like Celeste, you can usually run these at a six watt TDP. And this will give you some pretty great battery life. We'll talk more about that in the end. As you start working your way up to the more moderately powerful indie games like Hades, six watts isn't gonna be enough. As you can see right here, we're averaging less than 40 frames per second. For these games, I've found that a 10 watt TDP usually does the best. You can get a solid 60 frames per second that way. As you start moving your way up to the more like Xbox 360 era of games, you've got a couple options here. The first would be to play these games at a 1200p resolution, usually on medium or high settings, and that's usually going to require about a 15 watt TDP profile. And these games at 1200p look absolutely great. And I'd say if you wanted to save a little bit of power here, you could do 10 watt TDP, but you'd have to drop the resolution to 800p instead. Either way, it's nice to have that option here, depending on how much battery life you have to spare. However, I found that the sweet spot for me with this system is going to be a 20 watt TDP. This is gonna allow me to play some of those older AAA titles, things like Destiny 2 or Doom Eternal at a 1200p resolution, and they look absolutely awesome. Now, in order to get a solid 60 frames per second, you'll often have to use low settings, but even then, I think that low settings at 1200p looks better than medium settings at 800p. Regardless, I think these PC games look great and they're gonna play very nicely on these really smooth analog sticks as well. Now, even though we have a nice beefy CPU on this device, there are gonna be some games that just can't run really well at a 1200p resolution. So games like Control, which has always been a very demanding game, or even something like Elden Ring is probably gonna be best served at an 800p resolution. But overall, these games are gonna be nice and playable at a 20 watt TDP, which is gonna give you about 90 minutes of battery life as well. And so in conclusion, when it comes to PC games specifically, yes, this thing can play just about every game you want. But by virtue of being a handheld system as well as having integrated graphics, you may have to make some concessions here or there. And generally that'll require you to lower the resolution or graphical fidelity to get a smooth frame rate, or you may have to increase the thermal profile, which will reduce the battery life as well. And that's really the same story for any of these handheld PCs. PCs. And so now let's talk briefly about emulation as well, because I think a lot of people who are interested in this device might want to do this too. Number one, let's just start with the harder systems because everything below this is going to play just fine. When it came to GameCube, I found that a 15 watt TDP was more than enough. In fact, you could actually increase the 3D rendering resolution to a 4X and still get really smooth gameplay here. And so this is effectively gonna give you about a 1440p resolution, which is more than enough for this display and it looks incredible. Now the PS2 emulator can actually go up in half step increments. So here we're using a 3.5X resolution at a 15 watt TDP and most games play really well. Some of the harder games to emulate, something like Metal Gear Solid 2 will actually require you to drop it down to a 3X resolution or 1080p, but even then it still looks nice and sharp. So yes, when it comes to this generation of consoles, GameCube, PlayStation 2, it's gonna be great. Let's move on to the next one here with Nintendo Wii U. 
For this system in particular, I found that 15 watts was a little bit too slow for the Wii U. It would result in a little bit of slowdown here and there, but at a 17 watt TDP, everything was nice and smooth. So that's what I would recommend. And the nice thing here is that adjusting this TDP from 15 to 17 is super easy. On something like the Aya Neo device, you would have to make a custom profile and then go into that to change it to 17. Another nice thing about Wii U on this device is that many of the games have a graphics pack which will allow you to use a 16 by 10 aspect ratio. That means these games are going to fill out the whole screen without having to do any stretching. Now Breath of the Wild is always harder to emulate, but as you can see here, even with a 17 watt TDP, it's still running pretty great at a 1200p resolution. We're getting an average between 35 and 40 frames per second, and yeah, it looks gorgeous as well. Now if you wanted, you could blast that TDP all the way up to max, and that's going to give you closer to the 40 frames per second cap that I'm using on this game. But from my perspective, I don't think it's going to be worth it to max out the TDP just to get a couple more frames per second. And so for me, I think 17 watts is the sweet spot for Wii U. Moving over to PlayStation 3, for this one I alternated between 15 and 20 watt TDP. For some of those lightweight arcade style PS3 games like Afterburner Climax, 15 watts is plenty. But anything that required a little bit more juice usually did best at a 20 watt TDP instead. So something like Dead or Alive 5 or Demon's Souls really did well at a 20 watt TDP. And so what I would say for PS3 is that I would test it at 15 watts first and then see if 20 watts actually improves it a little bit more. But in the end, if you want to guarantee some pretty good PS3 gameplay, then 20 watts is the place to be. Now, another interesting thing here I found with the PS3 emulator in particular is that if I maxed it out to 28 watt TDP, it wouldn't actually go up that high. It would usually cap out at 20 watts anyway. And so long story short, yeah, 20 watt TDP for PS3 seems to be the best. When it came to Xbox 360 emulation, I just did a couple tests here just to make sure it was running okay, and everything seemed to be fine. As you know, the issue with this emulator is more about compatibility than performance. But I found that a 20 watt TDP seems to be the sweet spot here as well. And finally, I did a little bit of Nintendo Switch emulation as well. What was really interesting to me was that the INEO 2, which has the same chipset as this one here, usually did best at 25 watts and not 20. So I'm not really sure why this one's doing better at Nintendo Switch at a lower TDP, but I'm happy to see it. It could really be as simple as just having some optimizations added to the emulator over the past few weeks. Either way, yes, when it comes to PC games and emulation, this thing can play just about everything. Now, the last thing I wanted to do was to test to see whether or not Botticera would boot. If you're not familiar with it, Botticera is a Linux-based operating system focused on retro gaming, and everything resides on the flash drive you see up here on the top. That includes the ROMs as well as the emulators. And I'm happy to report that just like with the INEO 2, it does boot up just fine. However, it does have the same screen stretching issue that we found on that device as well. And this is due to the fact that the panels on these are actually vertical panels and not horizontal. And so what this really means is that once more people get this in their hands, they'll probably have a fix in Botticera soon. The most important part here is that it boots, which is awesome. On top of that, I was surprised to find that the RGB lighting also persisted in Botticera as well. Obviously, there's not going to be any settings within Botticera to adjust these controls, but either way, it's pretty cool it's here. All right, and as we start wrapping up here, let's talk next about battery life. To start, when it comes to charging, it takes about an hour and 40 minutes to charge it from 0 to 100. And I found that if you put it to sleep overnight, it loses about 6% of battery altogether. Now, I spent a couple days really doing some heavy testing here to make sure I had some accurate battery life readings. And I tested it at all of the major TDPs that I found were the most effective for this device. Starting with the highest TDP, if I maxed it out to 28 watts and I ran God of War at 1200p, you can see here that battery lasted just under an hour. It was a little bit better than the INEO 2, but not by much. At a 20 watt TDP, I would expect about an hour and a half of battery life altogether, and I was surprised to find that I had a big jump in battery performance when I dropped it down to a 15 watt TDP. Here I was getting 2 hours and 20 minutes of battery life, and then when I dropped it even more to a 10 watt TDP, I actually capped out over 3 hours. And then finally, if I turned off everything I could, including the LEDs and Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, and then I also set the TDP to 6 watts and turned on battery saver, I was able to get about 4 hours and 20 minutes altogether. And so we have a wide range of battery life options here, depending on how many sacrifices you want to make when it comes to TDP or other functions. But in the end, I found most commonly I would use between 15 and 20 watts, and so you can expect about 2 hours of battery life altogether at those wattages. And so overall, yes, the battery performance here is not great, but it is never great with any of these x86 handheld PCs. But if you're willing to do that song and dance when it comes to TDP and resolution, you can usually find a sweet spot around two to three hours. 
All right, so let's move over to the summary of this review now. Let's talk about what I like and what I don't like about the One X Player Mini Pro. I was surprised to find there were many things that I liked about this device. It is a good manageable size. I'd say it's about 20% smaller than the Steam Deck, which makes it a lot more portable. On top of that, as we saw, the performance here is great. We can play just about every PC or emulated game that we want. And really the next three points here are actually my favorite of the device overall. Number one is that settings overlay. I love being able to tap that quick menu button and have easy access to TDP and resolution, but then you can also make quick adjustments to things like the rumble and the RGB lighting, as well as the screen brightness too. And so like I mentioned earlier, this is easily my favorite quick menu option right now. I also found that I really liked the RGB lighting more than I thought. At first I thought it was just kind of cheesy, but the more I used it, I felt like it enhanced my overall gameplay experience. And by comparison, something like the RGB lighting that's around the analog sticks of the i and Neo devices can be a little bit distracting compared to what you're looking at on the screen. And I found that the RGB lighting on this device here was more complementary in nature, just by the fact that it was a little bit further from the screen than the analog sticks. Now speaking of analog sticks here, that's the other highlight of this device. They are exceptionally smooth and really nice to the touch. I would say that I actually prefer them to the Steam Deck analog sticks, which are really good too. I'm also a fan of the screen. Now it's not the best out there in the world, but I think it is pretty good. The audio quality here is very good too. A lot of that has to do with the fact that it has front firing speakers. And finally, I didn't really know where to mention this earlier in the review, but I do like the rumble feedback here as well. Now, as far as I know, this is not linear rumble, so it's not like a haptic feedback or anything else like that, but there is a good amount of choice when it comes to the intensity of the rumble here. And so if you only want a little bit of vibration or a lot or anything in between, those are all options. And so overall, yes, I think there's a lot to like about the Mini Pro, but of course it's not perfect. So let's talk about what I don't like. Probably my number one dislike here is the diagonals when it comes to D-pad gaming. I think the vast majority of games that people are going to be playing on this are going to be PC games anyway, and so the D-pad probably won't come into play that often. But if you were looking to play something like fighting games with the D-pad, I wouldn't recommend it. I also didn't like the small amount of friction I got from pressing down on the triggers. The movement itself is still fairly snappy, but it definitely feels like a mechanical movement. And so it just kind of lacks that smooth gliding feeling that comes from some of the other analog triggers that I've tried before. I also think that the lack of a micro SD card slot is kind of a user unfriendly move. I think it would have been better to have that micro SD card slot so that people could buy whatever device they can afford at the time. And then if they want to expand the storage later, they can do that easily with a micro SD card. Now the next one here isn't really about this device in particular, but just bear in mind that when you buy an x86 handheld PC, the battery life is not going to be great. This is the same story with any other product, including the Steam Deck. And so what this means, if you want to maximize the battery life here, you are going to have to get smart on the ideas of TDP and resolution. Because really, in order to get the most out of this device, you are going to have to do that song and dance between those two options. Thankfully, the quick menu overlay makes that a lot easier than it is on other devices. And finally, this one is nitpicky to me, but I'm not a fan of the type of plastic that they used on this device. It's quite a bit smudgy, and it is exacerbated by the fact that it is a black device. And so if you're like me and you don't like seeing smudges on your device, I would maybe consider getting the white version instead of the black one here. And so in the end, do I think that the One X Player Mini Pro is a good device to pick up? Well, I think it's going to come down to a few factors. Number one, I think this is a handheld PC for PC gaming enthusiasts. And so if you enjoy getting the max performance you can out of a handheld, this device makes it pretty easy on you. The fact that we're using a 6800U CPU and that you have a very easy quick access menu means that you can make those tweaks on the fly. And that tweaking experience is the best I've seen on a handheld PC. The other factors here are going to be whether or not you prefer to have Windows gaming over Linux on the Steam Deck, and then also whether or not the Steam Deck is even available in your region. When all is said and done, if you want a handheld PC that you can treat more like a console, where you can just grab your game and start playing immediately and just let the system take care of itself, then in that case I think this Steam Deck is a better fit. However, if you're comfortable in living in the world of settings and adjusting things like drivers and all the other fun that comes with Windows, then this is a pretty good bet. And like I mentioned in the intro, I think One X Player recognizes this as well. Everything from their marketing materials to the RGB lighting on this device itself just screams that this is made for PC gamers. And so if you think you fit that description, then yeah, I think you're going to have a lot of fun with this device. Anyway, that's about it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. And be on the lookout for my One X Player 2 review coming in the next few weeks. As always, thank you for watching and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful and we will see you next time. Happy gaming.